today we have a great pleasure to welcome three researchers, very, very big names in polyhedra and rhetorics. Today we will welcome Michele Conforti, who will start with this morning talk of one hour. Then we will have questions and discussions until noon. Then we have a lunch break until 1.30. And then in the afternoon session, we welcome Andras Segel uh, from 1.30 to 2.30. And after that, again, a short break of half an hour. And from 3 from 2 4, we have Francisco Barajona joining us from the United States. So thanks uh, to all of you for, for being with us today. And particularly thanks to our invited speakers to uh, accept our invitations. We were hoping, uh, we were planning this meeting already last year. Unfortunately, due to the pandemics, we were not able to organize it in person. We postponed it. Again, we are again online. And so we said no postponements anymore. We want to hear what are the newest developments in the field from the best people from the field. So, Michele is going to start today. Let me just tell you a few, few words about Michele. So, he got his uh, PhD from the Carnegie Mellon University under the supervision of Gerard Cornejoz. And uh, he started working in discrete mathematics and discrete optimization, working on combinatoric structural graphs and matrix theory. And in the year 2000, he received the Fulkerson Prize together with uh, Gerard Cornejoz and M. Rao for the work on balanced matrices. Then uh, Michele claims that more recently he became interested in, in integer programming due to the writing of the book, which became a very, very famous book and excellent, uh, almost like, like a Bible for people, and particularly for PhD students, but also more senior researchers who work in integer programming. This book was uh, written together with, uh, again, Gerard Cornejoz and Giacomo Zambelli. And for this book in the year 2015, the authors received Lancaster Prize. And uh, as a curiosity, if you didn't know, his real name is Michelangelo. So uh, today we have a great pleasure to listen to the talk of Michelangelo Conforti, and the title of the talk is Cut Dominance and Forbidden Minors. So Michele, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again for being with us today. Well, <laughs> that's too much. Thanks, <laughs> Ivana, for this flattering introduction, which I don't deserve. Maybe I should say that, yes, um, uh, in the past years, I was interested in integer programming, but when uh, Rida I uh, said, well, why don't you give a talk? I said, well, maybe I should, uh, I proposed two subjects. One was in integer programming and one was in polyhedra. And he said, polyhedra, no doubt. So good. So that's polyhedra. And um, in fact, uh, it's uh, polyhedra, but uh, very much uh, traditional school and related to I think important results that were obtained uh, in Grenoble by Andras' uh, favorite friends, that means Donina Def and Jean Follet. And my work is uh, joint with uh, Sam uh, Fiorini, Konstantin, uh, and also I will talk about some more recent work that I've been doing with Volker Kaiko. So control L, that's what you say? Yes. <laughs> So uh, what I'm going to talk about, in fact, is um, uh, kind of an embarrassing failure of polyhedral combinatorics, if I may say so, but uh, Andras will object. OK, so here is the object that I want to study. I have an undirected graph, and uh, I want to study the following polyhedra. Uh, which is called the cut dominant. And it is the incidence, uh, the convex hull of the incidence vectors of the, do you see my hand? Yes. Of yes. the um, non-empty, the proper cuts. So delta of S is the set of edges that goes out of a node set S, but the S, has to be non-empty and its complement has to be non-empty. The graph is undirected, but I add the non-negative orthant. 
So this, uh, when you have a polyhedron uh, of this type, it's called the dominant type polyhedron. And uh, you can uh, clearly optimize, uh, non minimize, uh, optimize mean minimize, non-negative uh, um, objective function. Because if an objective function has a negative component, then the value is minus infinity due to this array. So, uh, in fact, if you optimize over this polyhedron, a non-negative objective function, you get the minimum weight of a cut. And that's what I wrote here. So, you see, uh, you want, uh, the, again, this, if you optimize over this, uh, you get the minimum weight proper cut. And uh, there are several ways to do it. One is uh, everybody knows how to find a minimum weight cut that separates two specific nodes. So you choose, uh, you fix a node, you pick all the other nodes and you find the minimum weight cut that separates this beginning node from all the other nodes. You take the best of them and that's, uh, uh, that solves this problem. But uh, there are other ways, much uh, uh, more uh, interesting. No, I mean, uh, one uh, is the famous uh, max back uh, algorithm of Nagamochi Maraki, which uh, is a very fast way of finding, again, two nodes, say S and T, such that delta of S, so the star of node S, is a minimum cut that separates S and T. So you find this, you contract and you recurse. And since Maurice hopefully is not sleeping, I should mention that um, he took this uh, idea to find a beautiful algorithm to minimize uh, symmetric modular functions. There are other uh, computer science style of uh, algorithms like uh, randomized contraction and uh, the work of Chandra Chekuri is also very much related to this. So this is to say that uh, optimizing an, a function, a linear function over this polyhedron can be done efficiently. Um, It's in the last 10 or more so years, there has been uh, uh, lots of uh, fantastic results uh, on extended formulation. So how to represent a polyhedron in a higher dimensional space so that the original one is the projection. And clearly the uh, algorithm, the first algorithm that I just uh, uh, outlined, find uh, all ST cuts and choose the best, immediately gives an extended formulation via union of polyhedra. And uh, so this uh, cut dominant can be formulated as the union of cardinality of V minus one ST cut polyhedron and each one of them in the original with the original variable is not compact, but if you be direct at the edges and use flow variable, then it is compact. You can also use another classical results in polyhedral combinatorics, which is uh, the rooted cut uh, result uh, of Edmonds. What you can do is be direct at the edges, so find uh, a directed graph out of your undirected graph by, for each edge of the undirected graph, you put two arcs in opposite direction, you arbitrarily choose a root. And now the cuts in this, uh, the so-called rooted cuts in this uh, bidirected graph are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the cuts in the original graph and uh, the rooted cut polyhedron dominant has been characterized by Edmonds. 
uh, because the only inequalities that are needed, there are exponentially many of them, are rooted arborescences. For every rooted arborescence, you have to pick uh, um, an edge. And all the super experts in polyhedral combinatorics are started sleeping because this is super well known. What uh, maybe is less well known, but I find it uh, super interesting, is this result of Carr, Congevod, Little, Natraj, and Parec, I think 2009, which describes to me a crazy polyhedron. Uh, I, um, I will explain a little bit what it is because uh, first of all, uh, what I said before, the graph is undirected, but does not have to be a complete graph. Here, the graph has to be complete. Uh, and the nodes have to be numbered one through n. The numbering is arbitrary, but uh, it's important. It's fundamental for this formulation. It's an extended formulation, but instead of uh, basically doubling the edge variables, it introduces, it keeps the original edge variables and it introduces node variables. So for each node of the graph, you have uh, one variable. So the number of variables is order of n squared, where n, n is the number of vertices. The node variables are, the constraints are a simplex on the node variables two to n. The first node, node number one, has no variable. And then you have a subset of the so-called triangle inequalities that has been modified. I say a subset because uh, triangle inequalities are defined over a triple of indices, but here you write inequalities only for i, j less than k. Remember that for a triple of indices, you have three triangle inequalities. Clearly, if you take three indices, uh, this is always satisfied, but you have only one triangle and you write that xi k plus xjk is at least twice uh, the, vari the node variable zk plus xij. These are non-negative variables. This is a polyhedron. It's not a dominant type. It's not a dominant polyhedron. So its recession cone is uh, smaller than the non-negative constant. Um, it's not an integral polyhedron. So the vertices may be fractional. However, what the authors prove with uh, the famous uh, splitting off lemma theorem of uh, Lovas and Mader, that if you minimize a non-negative function over this polyhedron and uh, a zero function, uh, so no negative function over the edges, the x, j, j variable, and zero here, then you get always an integral solution. So although the polyhedron is not integral, you get an integral solution. And uh, the integral solution is the incidence vector of a minimum cut. Uh, it would be, to the best of my knowledge, this has not really been exploited uh, algorithmically. There is a, a connection that every, uh, of this uh, cut dominant, so let's go back to the cut dominant, to, um, uh, graphical TSP. So this was defined by Conway Jules von Lipton and F many years ago. They were young. Um, so a tour 
is a, a span. So they didn't like the fact that TSP was defined on a complete graph. They said there are too many variables. Most of the time, I want to find a tour in um, um, uh, a sparse graph. But we all know that uh, it's even MP hard to find whether such a tour exists. So uh, they define a tour in a slightly different way. So it's a closed walk. So it's a Eulerian subgraph that, but spanning that must touch all the vertices. And the graphical traveling salesman polyhedron is the convex hull of the incidence vector of the tours. And they have several papers uh, about the uh, structure of this polyhedron. Notice that the TSP is just the face of this polyhedron obtained by setting X of delta V uh, and for every node equals to two. So imposing that in every node that you have exactly two edges. Clearly, since uh, you have a tour and the tour touches all the nodes, then these inequalities are satisfied. For every cut of the graph, the sum of the variable of the incidence vector of a tour is at least two. So if you pick a non-negative vector that satisfies this, um, this is uh, uh, a relaxation of the graphical traveling salesman, and it's the famous uh, subtour of polyhedron that everybody wants to study, but it's very hard. And um, uh, although you can optimize over this by Kachen, um, but uh, the vertices of this polyhedron, they are clearly fractional and uh, are not completely characterized. And if you could characterize them, maybe you could solve the famous uh, fourth third conjectures for metric uh, TSP. Uh, why our polyhedron, the cut dominant, uh, is uh, uh, so complicated to study, although we can optimize, it's because uh, um, the cut dominant, it's really the set of non-negative vectors that satisfies this inequality, the Cx greater than or equal to two, where C is a vertex of the subtour. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between vertices of this uh, subtour uh, polyhedron and uh, the facets of the catalog. So we're talking about two things that are, seem to be different, but they are the same. One is to characterize these facets, one is to characterize these vertices, but they are the same. And uh, Sylvia Boyd, when she was a baby, in her doctoral dissertation, studied uh, the vertices of this polyhedron. And also, uh, this was uh, computers uh, many years ago, um, did the computer search for small graphs of all these vertices. That in fact uh, is very, it's on our web page and it's very nice and uh, um, useful to study these problems. Um, and this is the result I want to, uh, maybe I should uh, do this better. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, Jean von Lübt and Donina Def uh, um, studied the following question. So subtour is a relaxation of the graphical TSP. So the graphical TSP is what you would like to optimize, but it's NP hard. So most likely you will not get all the facets, but you can ask yourself, when is it true that the two polyhedra coincide? Clearly, subtour contains graphical TSP, but uh, when is it true that uh, 
uh, they are the same. First of all, they realize that this property is closed under minors. Minors is a fundamental property in graph theory in which you delete edges and you contract edges. And uh, they prove that the graphical TSP is, uh, coincides with the subtour if and only if G, the graph does not contain three minors that um, I will uh, uh, explain better in uh, three graphs and I will explain these graphs uh, later on. And uh, what uh, our results with uh, Sam and blah, blah, blah are related. Um, this result of uh, von Lübner-Def, it's not that easy to prove, and um, um, <laughs> the paper is written by them, so it's not very well written. Um, um, uh, there have been, but the results is super interesting, and in fact, it had attracted the uh, other researchers to try to reprove it. One way to find an alternative proof of this result is uh, the following. Uh, if you look at, uh, we all know min max results, right? Uh, the minimum transversal is the maximum number of uh, element disjoint members of a family. These results are, they exist, but they are rare. Uh, a property that is uh, related to this, but it's weaker, is the so-called Erdos-Posa property, which is the following, uh, which says in this specific case, uh, what uh, it implies the following. Uh, every graph either has K vertex disjoint cycles or it contains a subset of the nodes whose size is at most a function of k, so in this case is k log k, such that g minus s is a cyclic. So either there are many node disjoint cycles or with few vertices, you can kill them all. Removing these vertices destroys all the size. Um, I think Lovas was a teenager when he proved this. Um, in case of two node disjoint cycles, Dirac and Lovas uh, proved the following. Uh, a graph with minimum degree two, uh, three contains uh, no two vertex disjoint cycle, if and only if. Either G removing a vertex is a forest. So all cycles, that means that all cycles go through a certain node. Or G is a wheel. A wheel is a circuit together with a node out of a cycle. And this node is universal for the circuit. Or G is K5, you see K5, uh, uh, contains no two vertexes joint cycles because every cycle is a triangle and you have five vertices. Uh, or else uh, there existed three nodes such that if you remove these three nodes, uh, the graph uh, contains no edges. Um, and uh, time ago, a student of Michel Gomans give uh, a proof of the von lübner delf uh, theorem that uses uh, this uh, Lovas dirac lovas theorem. The proof is pretty, I wouldn't say, um, it, invo uh, it involves a, a big case analysis. It involves a big case analysis. It's long, it's still not very nice, but it involves because there are lots of By the way, I mean, uh, we can prove this theorem. Um, um, our theorem that I will state uh, 
uh, implies this theorem. Uh, and we think that the proof is nice. Um, let's go back to cut dominant uh, of G. Remember the convex hull of all the cuts in a graph plus the non-negative one. Can we say something about the inequalities of uh, uh, this uh, poly that uh, uh, give the a description of this polyhedron in terms of uh, facets and outer description? We can say something. And uh, here we can say, uh, um, that if you have a valid inequality, you can always define what is called a subgraph um, out of your graph, which is given by the edges of your graph whose uh, coefficient, excuse me, whose coefficient in the inequality is positive. Remember that this, this C is non-negative because the polyhedron is of the dominant type. And uh, the inequality, uh, then if you, once you write this, lambda, this right-hand side, is greater than or equal to the minimum value of a cut in this weighted graph. So it's a graph in which the edges have positive weights. And uh, this uh, um, facet, this inequality will define a facet if and only if lambda is in fact the value of this minimum cut. And you have a family of subset of edges such that uh, of your graph of, uh, excuse me, of subset of nodes, and you have as many of them as edges of this support graph in such a way that uh, all these cuts, delta of S for this family are minimum and the incidence vectors are linearly independent. And furthermore, this family, can be chosen to be laminar. Laminar means that if you take two sets in the family, they are either disjoint or one inside of the other. It is well known that a laminar family cannot be very big, as at most uh, twice the number of element uh, uh, members. So the support uh, of a facet, even if you have a complete graph, the support of a facet is always a sparse, is always a, a graph, a subgraph that is a spanning, but the number of edges is linear in the number of vertices, is at most twice the number of vertices. There is a, um, a theorem of Giovanni Rinaldi, Lawrence Fulci, and myself, that uh, tells you that if you have a facet and uh, this facet is uh, in uh, minimum integer form, so C is an integral vector, so the weights are integral, but uh, relatively prime, and the lambda, so the edge connectivity, is odd, then uh, lambda is one. So you cannot have facets with a lambda in which you cannot put weights on the edges and find a facet in which the edge connectivity is odd and greater than one. Notice that the facets with lambda equal to one are known to everybody because they are spanning trees. If you look, uh, if you take a graph, and you take an edge set, which is a spanning tree, and you write that the sum of the variables on this spanning tree is at least one, that's a valid inequality for the cut dominant. It's a facet. And the, all the facets with right-hand side one are exactly of this type. 
So the search for facets is the search for facets with lambda even, because the only facets with lambda odd is lambda equals to one and are super well understood. So we search for these facets, understanding that lambda is even. And we say <coughs> that a graph is a K graph if uh, every facet, um, maybe before saying this, uh, um, I would like to say one word is that uh, narrow-minded the people in polyhedral combinatorics, when would they start to see ugly facets, so with big coefficient, and in particular, maybe with big right-hand sides, they um, become suspicious that the thing, the polyhedron may be very difficult to describe. So uh, with this uh, narrow viewpoint in mind, uh, we can uh, try to look for easy facets, so with uh, small right-hand sides, and see for which graphs they suffice to describe the cut dominant. Incidentally, not even for planar graphs. For planar graphs, you can have uh, facets in which lambda is even, but arbitrarily not. <clears throat> so we define a K graph, a graph for which every facet, obviously minimum integer form, has a right-hand side less than or equal to K. And uh, the K star of G is the minimum value of K for which G, G is a K graph. Um, if you take any course in graph theory, you will know that the minor of a graph is obtained from G by a sequence of contractions of edges, identifying the endpoints of an edge, and the edge deletion, removing an edge, and no deletion. But the key fact is the following. If G prime is a minor of G, then K star of G prime is less than or equal than K star of G. So the facet complexity, the largest right-hand side of G prime cannot grow, is less than or equal than the largest right-hand side of G. So we can say that the graph is a minor minimal non-K graph, if, it's, uh, if there exists a facet with right-hand side uh, K star, which is greater than K, but uh, for every proper minor G prime, the largest right-hand side is at most K. And uh, the key question is, what fix K, give me a K, what are the minor minimum? It follows from this uh, super uh, important uh, graph minor result of Robertson and Seymour that if you fix K, the list of minor minimal non-K graph is finite. What are they? Uh, <coughs> there are trivial results. The minor minimal non-zero graphs is an edge. The minor, minor minimal no, no one graph is a triangle because if you have a triangle and uh, you write that the sum of the edges is at least a two, this is a facet in minimum integer form of the cut dominant. And so uh, can we go on? and uh, ask uh, what are the minor minimal non two graphs? Since the minor minimal non zero graph, no one graphs are trivial. And uh, our result is that the minor minimal non two graphs are the prism and the pyramid 
I will try to uh, illustrate this, uh, um, maybe here. Okay, no, maybe here. Okay. The first graph is the prism. It has uh, six vertices. If you put uh, a weight of two on these red edges and a weight of one on uh, the edges in the triangle, then the edge connectivity is four. So the size of a minimum cut is four. And uh, if you look at these blue blobs, they define subset of edges S that form a laminar family. Every two subsets are either one inside the other or incomparable. And uh, um, <coughs> every cut, for instance, you take this big blob, you see you have these four edges, each one of weight one. So this cut uh, is a, a minimum cut. If I take this node, which correspond to this blob, the cut is given by this edge of weight two and these edges of weight one, and uh, they are minimum cuts. All these cuts are linearly independent, and uh, therefore twice the sum of these uh, edges, the red edges, plus twice the plus once the sum of the edges in the triangle greater than or equal to four is a facet of the cut dominant. And uh, um, so showing that every graph that contains this graph as a minor must contain a facet with right hand side at least four. The, so this is the prism, the pyramid is obtained by the so-called delta y transformation. So substituting this delta y transformations are super important in this context. Uh, by substituting these three edges with uh, these three edges that connect this new node, the new edges have a weight of two because you see going out of this node, you had a weight of two, so they have a weight of two. And the cuts, the structure of the cuts are the same. So this is another uh, known to graphs and the result of uh, Sam, Konstantin, and uh, um, me is that these are the only minimal known to graphs. How is it related to uh, von Lübcke and Nadef? Von Lübcke and Nadef prove that the graphical TSP coincides with a subtour if and only if the graph does not contain these two graphs as a minor, plus a third graph, which is the so-called three path configuration. You have uh, two vertices which are joined by three paths, each one of length three. Uh, out of this result, we can uh, uh, prove uh, von Lübcke-Nadef. Um, <coughs> And I have to say that uh, von Lüb, uh, given von Lübner-Def result, I we can also retrieve our result in a relatively straightforward way. Okay. Um, okay. What about bigger values? There are lots of questions that uh, remain unanswered. And for instance, uh, the first question, which I believe this is true, um, is there a, a graph which is a minor minimal non-K graph and it's, okay, to put it the other way, is there a facet producing graph for which the right-hand side is any even number? We know that there are no odd numbers except one. And in particular, for um, K 
can we give a construction that generates at least the sum of these graphs? So for each value k, I want a graph that produces a facet in minimum uh, integer form whose right-hand side is k, k is it. The second conjecture I will not explain because it could be complicated. Um, obviously, it's good to have a PhD students. So I had a PhD student that uh, Federica Cecchetto that uh, investigated the, the structure of uh, graphs with uh, even right hand side bigger than uh, four. Uh, I only give you some. For instance, uh, if you pick this graph, again, they have to be sparse. And you pick this, uh, um, can you tell me how many edges this graph has without counting? Well, remember that the number of edges is uh, the number of uh, cuts in the facet that define the facet. Here you have uh, how many cuts? You have 10 singleton cuts, five uh, cuts with uh, uh, two members, and finally, um, two cuts with the four members. So this family has uh, this graph as if I'm, 10 plus five plus two uh, edges. If you assign to the edges these weights, so this inner edge has a weight of five, this edge has a weight of two, then uh, what is the edge connectivity? It's, if you look at the cut that goes out of this node is five plus two plus three, which is 10. If you look at the cut that goes out of this two vertices, is uh, three plus three plus two plus two is 10 again. So, and the, all these cuts are linearly independent. So this is a 10 graph. So this graph with this weighting defines a facet with right-hand side 10. And uh, I am not going to bug you with uh, much more complicated uh, graphs um, uh, but uh, um, again, um, uh, a construction, an automatic construction of uh, a, a graph that gives me a facet with right hand side k for k even is uh, still uh, elusive. I would like to. Uh, go back to a related problem. Uh, and this is uh, the question. Uh, we all have heard of Steiner cuts. So what is a Steiner cut? Again, you have a graph. You have a subset T of terminal, must contain at least two nodes. A cut of the graph is a Steiner cut if it separates at least two nodes in T. So if S contains at least one node in T and V minus S contains at least one node in T, and uh, the Steiner cut dominant is the convex hull of all the incidence vectors of the Steiner cuts plus the non-negative order. So again, if T is exactly the set of nodes of the graph, then the Steiner cut dominant is the cut dominant of which we saw, which I treated before. And uh, if T contains only two vertices, then this is the famous uh, ST cut dominant for which everybody knows uh, 
the inequalities, you just have to write that for every ST path, uh, the sum of the variable must be at least one because cut and path intersects in an odd number of uh, <coughs> elements. And uh, this is it, that's an integral polyhedron uh, by, by path decomposition of flows. And, uh, but uh, for T greater than two, what are these things? So, again, uh, you can optimize over the Steiner cut dominant by solving T minus one minimum cuts. And uh, uh, so you, that gives you an extended formulation. And I have to say that the formulation that I briefly uh, mentioned of Carr et al for uh, um, a polytope that a polyhedron that allows you to optimize and find uh, a minimum cut also can be changed a little bit. And still you have an integral polyhedron that allows you to find the minimum standard. <coughs> Uh, remember that uh, um, we, um, we defined the complexity in terms of the largest right-hand side of a facet in minimum integer form. Uh, a result of Volker, uh, Kaibor, and myself is that uh, this largest right-hand side does not depend on the graph only depends on the size of uh, the Steiner determinant, the set T. So there exists a function F such that every facet in minimum integer form of the Steiner cut dominant has right-hand side at most F of caminality of T. And uh, we also prove that uh, if you have at most five terminals, then uh, this value is two. Uh, so all facets have right-hand side either one and they are just called Steiner trees or two. Um, and uh, these are more complicated to describe. Uh, This is what uh, I had to say. Thank you very much, Helen. Very uh, extensive presentation, providing us a lot of uh, interesting results from different angles. Uh, now we have plenty of time for questions. And uh, I would like to invite our uh, participants from the audience to start uh, with uh, open questions. I'm sure that Andras will have many questions. Exactly. I, I was just wanted to say, Andras, you're, you're on mute. We cannot hear you, but I see that you were raising the hand. So I thought... Uh, no, I, no I, I, I did not raise my hand, ah. but uh, I prefer to put my questions afterwards or to Michele in private. <laughs> so because they are embarrassing? I don't know. I don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, let me see if there are other questions. So please uh, just make sure that you unmute yourself and then go ahead. Or well, maybe while we are waiting for the questions, maybe Michaela, I have one question. This, uh, uh, this new formulation of, I, I guess it's new, of car. No, 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 no. I think the paper is from 2009, mm -hmm. the car and uh, I have seen, but. This formulation, I really looked uh, into the details. For instance, they don't say, uh, they prove that if you minimize, uh, um, should I go back to this formulation? Yes, yes. So basically my question was, what is the intuition behind the formulation? And oh, I can uh, explain what, a little bit. And also were they using it mainly to show this result related to the minimum cut point, to the integer points representing the minimum okay. cut? Or did they use it also in some other context? No, they uh, use it, uh, they, no, they use it for minimum cut. Mm -hmm. They say, 
they say something that is slightly incorrect. That uh, if, uh, um, okay, I say what is correct uh, because there's no point in, uh, first of all, I try to give an intuition of this formulation. Okay, these, uh, apart from node one, let's put, an in, let's take a zero one vector that satisfies this constraint, okay? And uh, let's uh, do the following. Um, what is uh, the meaning of this constraint? Sum of zi equals one. So there will be among nodes two to n, exactly one node for which this variable takes value one. What is this, what is this uh, node? Remember that nodes are numbered from one through n. And if you have a cut S without delta of S, without loss of generality, node one is in S. What is this node that has uh, among two to n that has a value one? Is the node of a smallest index that is uh, in V minus S. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so say that node one is in S and node, remember that here is written arbitrary, but important. Uh, because think about this, assume that node one is in F, uh, in S and Z four uh, is one. So node four is in V minus S. Nodes uh, one, two, three must be in S because node four is the node of a smallest index that is uh, in V minus S. So what are these uh, constraints? First of all, <coughs> you see these constraints say edge, uh, one four, edge two four, edge three four must be one because Z four is one. Uh, and these uh, triangle inequalities mean the following. Pick, uh, say, one four. You see, they say, if it is in minimum integer form, that this is one, this is one, but this has to be zero in minimum. Again, when you have a minimum support vector, a vector that cannot be decreased and stay in the point. So, and uh, so it's relatively easy to um, understand that if you have a vector that is integral, then it contains uh, the uh, support vector of a cut. What is not easy, and it requires, uh, or at least they give two proofs, but the, the easiest proof is uh, through splitting off. Uh, it's to prove that if you minimize a non-negative objective function on the edges, then uh, over this formulation, you get an integral point, and this point uh, is uh, the incidence vector of a cut. And that I cannot, I mean, it's long, it's long. I see. Andres Thank is- you. Yeah, now, now I, no, 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 I, I, just the opposite. So I, I would like to uh, say that I am very happy because in the past years, we heard many negative results, great mathematics, but negative results about extended formulations, that even problems that we can solve in polynomial time uh, with, uh, and, and uh, have many constraints, so the, we can also uh, solve them in polynomial time with the ellipsoid method, uh, they ha don't have uh, small extended formulations. So I wondered uh, whether there are many positive examples and you showed uh, some new extended formulations. Now, uh, can you tell uh, how and in one, under what conditions 
uh, you would really use extended formulations to solve problems, right? Because that was the initial goal to give extended formulations to uh, have uh, less constraints uh, with still a polynomial number of variables and to solve problems. So under what conditions would, would you use extended and which extended formulation to solve problems? Um, first of all, as you know, I <laughs> am not really a com an expert in computations, so I, I, I don't, don't mean I don't necessarily. No, mean... but let, let me let me finish yes. one second. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this formulation raises a super interesting question: Is there an algorithm, a primal dual? Okay, if you minimize uh, a non-negative non uh, function on the edges, you find a minimum cut. What is the dual solution? Can you design a primal dual algorithm that uses this formulation to find a minimum cut? And, and you? <laughs> um, uh, I'm trying. <laughs> Incidentally, um, I say the following. Um, if uh, you, suppose now you want to solve the minimum Steiner cut and you number the Steiner nodes, uh, in the beginning of this numbering. So the Steiner nodes are one up to cardinality of T, and then you have the remaining nodes. And you restrict this, uh, um, this uh, condition only to the Steiner nodes. So from two to cardinality of T, then uh, this is still an integral for, uh, excuse me, and you minimize a non-negative objective function you get a minimum uh, Steiner cut and um, uh, again, what is a dual? There is another question. What are the vertices of this? Uh, we know the vertices that are optimized by non-negative objective function. Can we say more about the vertices of this? They are fractional. There are fractional vertices. The first fractional vertices are, appear for graphs with seven nodes. And the second question is, what is um, uh, the recession cone? I don't know. This is, not a, this is an unbounded polyhedron. It's not a polytope. But the recession cone is not a non-negative order. So uh, I don't know what is the recession. It appears to be, because the recession cone gives exactly the objective functions of which uh, cannot be optimized at the vertex. But mind you that the vertices are fractional, but uh, it tells you exactly where uh, the objective functions that are unbounded. Last uh, idiotic remark that you know very well. If you have any polyhedron and you want to uh, with a, a nice formulation like this one, and you want to find compact, small, remember that this formulation is as, uh, as many variables as edges of Kn and uh, as many variables as nodes of K, uh, vertices. So order and square variables. The number of constraints is dominated by the triangle inequalities. So for each triple of nodes, you have one constraint. So order and square variables, order and cube constraints, very small. And, uh, but, if you, but this is not dominant. If you want a dominant of a polyhedron you, and you have a nice formulation, you can write a nice extended formulation because if you have a polyhedron P and you want the dominant, you write X greater than or equal to Y, Y in P. That's a formulation for the dominant. This means element-wise, x1 greater than or equal to y1 and blah, blah, blah. And uh, notice that the dominant of a polyhedron may have exponentially many facets compared to the polyhedron you start with. So this uh, compact, this idiotic compact formulation is very powerful, in fact. Would you use it? In a solution, no. that's the question. No, <laughs> but uh, I would uh, try to understand whether there is a, another algorithm for minimum cuts. 
there is a, an underlining uh, theme in all of in Nagamochi Baraki yes. perfectly well that yeah. uh, the uh, theme is the following um, I find the minimum cut by finding recursively the mean the smallest star of a node a minimum yeah. cut that is a star of a node and the proof of validity of this is of this type because by splitting off, by Lova splitting off, if you read the proof, it will reduce the minimum cut to the star of a node and the minimum cut of a smaller graph. And right. Be uh, this can be considered actually as a de-randomization of Karger's randomized algorithm. And uh, Andras Schrank has a nice uh, interpretation of this algorithm. That's how you would solve minimum cut problems. Uh, so, um, well, this is not an example uh, where, for the moment, extended formulations help. On the other hand, I didn't mean this kind of computational use. Uh, uh, I meant also kind of use that we have uh, of the ellipsoid method that allowed to, to scan through many problems uh, that we can solve in polynomial time. To, to give a, a, a general framework to it and also to detect new problems that you can solve in polynomial time. So uh, another use, which is not computational of extended formulations could be to give uh, for a problem that we cannot yet solve to give an extended formulation with a polynomial number of constraints and polynomial number of variables and where uh, solving the linear program of the extended formulation gives maybe an integer solution to the original problem. So I meant that maybe uh, by some side constraints or um, for the minimum, minimal, minimum, cut, minimum weight cut problem, uh, you, you have such an application of, of uh, the extended formulation that you gave. No. <laughs> Okay. Not yet. We have, we have another interesting question from Maurice Kere. Can you solve from, from Where Maurice? is he? The, I want to see his face. He doesn't show himself. He hides. Uh, that's uh, cheating. I'm not going to answer if I don't see him. <laughs> Salut. Tu le vois, toi? Oui, oui, je le vois. Où est-ce que tu le oui, vois? Oui, bonjour. Il faut je... aller un peu plus bas. Parce qu'on est maintenant nombreux à se montrer. Et tu vas un peu plus bas et il y a Maurice. Oui. Attends, où est-ce que je vais plus bas Ah, tiens. Ah, le voilà <rire> Bonjour. Je, je l'ai vu. Je suis à Oslo, en, en Norvège. Euh, visite notre ah, famille. Tu fais le grand-père je, je joue au grand-père, exactement. Euh, ma, ma question, c'est que la, cette formulation de Carr et autres, ça ressemble un petit peu à une formulation de type Balache, formulation étendue de type Balache, où les, les Z seraient les, les variables additionnelles. Et ça, ça a un petit peu cette saveur-là. Bon, il n'y a pas la, la multiplication des, des variables, mais est-ce qu'on ne peut pas un, trouver une relation Non, je ne pense pas. Je pense pas. Parce que euh, si tu lis... Euh, si tu regardes leur papier, euh, tu, pa, toi, tu, toi, tu es un expert en coupe. Euh, pardon, euh, mais tu connaissais cette, ce papier Non, pas du tout. Ben, mais tu connais Bob Carr Oui, oui, je connais. Et ben, et en fait, il y a des papiers successifs à ça que je dois... Non, euh, regarde, euh, tu vois, la... Euh, et confiance en, en moi cette, le Z que tu dois prendre, le bon Z, c'est exactement ce que je te dis. Tu prends la coupe et c'est le, le, le sommet d'index minimal qui est de l'autre côté de, du sommet 1. Mais donc ça, ça te fixe les sommets 1 à, disons, tous les, une partie des sommets un, du côté de 1, c'est-à-dire tous les sommets qui ont un index plus petit, mais le reste, c'est arbitraire. Après ça, tu n'as rien. Euh, et euh, je, je vois... En plus, elle est super petite, cette formulation. Euh, 
Et je n'arrive pas à... Si tu prends Flow Formulation euh, et tu fais Balas, euh, je n'arrive pas là, à réduire à une taille comparable. Donc, euh, et si tu regardes euh, la démonstration, euh, je ne vois pas Union of the Kingdom. Okay. Mais... Peut-être que je suis un peu aveugle ou un peu vieux. Mais tu n'as ah. pas vu Maurice non plus. Non, je n'ai pas vu Maurice, non. <rire> ok, merci. Euh, D'ailleurs, je suis un retraité comme toi. Hein. Mm -hmm. <rire> moi aussi, je suis émérite. Euh, moi, j'ai re refusé. Ok, now we, it's time for for the non-retired person students to pose questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> Or to give any additional comments. Mm. Yeah, perhaps I can try. We are, everybody hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. yes thank uh -huh. you. Uh, thank you for the, this generous talk with uh, a lot of interesting Con uh, content to think about. And uh, I, I want to talk about the K-graph. Uh, so they are linked with uh, the, uh, the all facet of the wrong facet are have a value at least K for, uh, for the RHS. And uh, I think in the other uh, more computational aspect is that sometimes we need to find some particular subgraph because we want to find uh, such type of inequalities. So finally, uh, is there in this case a way to, to, comp to find a subgraph corresponding to, to this case? And also I, I see in the paper because we can open a PDF during the talk that there are also some minimality about this uh, type of k graph and if there is a link between this minimality and particular or algorithmic way to find this type of graph. Um, if I understood uh, correctly your question, I think that um, I have mostly uh, uh, disappointing things to say in the sense that um, we, um, um, characterize uh, the minor minimal non two graphs and that these are four graphs. So the right-hand side of the facet is four. We, uh, Sam had a very good student uh, that killed on the task and wanted to characterize all the minor minimal non four graphs. And uh, um, all of them uh, see are the ones that we found are six graphs but we do not have a proof that the list is complete. And uh, um, be, beyond this, uh, um, so again, there is a, a much easier question. And the question is, uh, um, uh, well, forget about the finding them all. Give me one. I give you an even number, 40, 44, Give me uh, a minor mi uh, minimal graph, uh, which gives me a facet of 44. I cannot answer this question. <laughs> there is a related question, which is the following. For instance, uh, take, forget about these numbers and forget about uh, these red cuts. So only look at this black graph. This black graph, uh, if I show you this numbering and this file and uh, these cuts, you realize that these cuts are linearly independent and you tell me, hey, hey, this is a 12 graph. But if I don't give you this numbering and these cuts, uh, I have no way of knowing that this is a 12 graph. Mm. So I don't have a way of assigning weights, mm. positive weights, to the edges such that the weighted edge connectivity becomes 12 and you have 12 linearly independent cuts. 
I wish I could solve these problems, but they seem to be hard. I know many interesting properties of this graph. They have to be sparse. The number of two, if uh, the number of edges exceeds twice the number of vertices, that's never a facet. Because uh, as I showed, these cuts are always laminar. These there is another conjecture. And these are the only cuts in this graph, the only minimum cuts. And uh, so to prove that this facet is a simplicial, if you look at this facet as a polytope, this is a simplex. It has, uh, it's nothing more than a simplex. And you can ask yourself whether all these facets are simplicial. Again, there are many, many questions that, uh, in spite of uh, my super strong co-authors, uh, we cannot answer. So I don't, I mean, some positive results, but some very hard questions. On a, and again, on a polytope, for which there are many nice extended formulations for which you can optimize. But uh, you, the description seems to be very hard. And uh, maybe that's the message that you have to take. And it's hard because it's exactly the vertices of the subtour point. Mm. That's. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Michele. Maybe one more question. You said that uh, for planar graphs, so lambda can be arbitrarily large. What are, in terms of these worst case results, what are the simplest graphs that you are aware of where lambda can be arbitrarily large? Planar graphs. <laughs> planar, please, uh, sorry. <laughs> Let me share, wow, 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 wow. Let me uh, uh, try to show if I could, uh, I don't want a seven day trial, whatever. Okay, just a second. Um, no, we, we just see your uh, PDF. So you'll be just seeing Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here they are. All this, uh, just a second. This is a class of uh, planar graphs, uh, very simple. And uh, um, the right hand side uh, will be even and but arbitrarily large as soon as they grow. So, okay. Incidentally, um, uh, Cornwall's von Lucht and Adef, when they talk about graphical TSP, they say that for series parallel graphs, the right hand side is always two. This is true because. Uh, it's, uh, it follows from for Lupt and Adef, but their proof is totally incorrect. So the first proof that, uh, so you see this graph contain, contains K4 mine. Um, the proof that graphs that do not contain K3 minor, the right hand side is two, follows from for Lupt and Adef um, and follows from our results later on. But the first ones to establish this is from Lupten Nadef. Remember that uh, uh, the class of K graphs for which uh, uh, the largest right hand side of a facet is K is closed under mine. But the minor minimal graphs for um, uh, one, uh, two are easy, uh, three are um, relatively, excuse me, four are relatively easy. All even numbers greater than four seem to be very hard. Or at least uh, we tried and could not. Uh, we have general properties, but.